So let's go back to growing up. It was always the starving artist, right? It was always for me and my upbringing, have something to fall back on, have a plan B, if you will. Do you think a creative can make a living doing what she loves to do? It depends on what she loves to do and what making a living looks like for her (laughs) and a lot of other factors. I mean, I definitely think that people can make money with creative work. Sometimes I don't think they should. They think that they should because there's a sense of illegitimacy that comes with not making money. You're not pro. If you're not pro, you're not the real thing. It's this myth around creativity that unless you have like the stamp of approval of gatekeepers, you're not the real thing. And gatekeepers are the ones who hold the money bags. We've all read about the great resignation by now. Reports show that roughly 47 million people left their jobs in 2021, citing burnout, new opportunities, and starting a business as just a few reasons. But how many are leaving the workforce to pursue creative endeavors? And should they? I talk with Jessica Abel, author, artist, cartoonist, and coach for creatives who works with people to stop grinding and carve out the deep focus needed to finish and launch the game-changing work they want to be known for. In this episode, Jessica shares how to prioritize creativity in our lives, what success might look like in a creative industry, and how to make a real living through creative endeavors. And it's probably not what you think. Plus, Jessica helps us all navigate the pitfalls so many creatives stumble into. I can relate to that. I'm Jackie McDougal, and this is The Grown-Ass Woman's Guide. More and more women are joining book clubs these days as a way to share ideas and connect with other women. But what about a pod club? For women who love to discuss podcasts. Cool, right? Enter the Grown Ass Woman's Guide Pod Squad, a free monthly virtual event where we can chat about all things the Grown Ass Woman's Guide. Bring questions, comments, topic ideas, and strong opinions on recent episodes. Some months will include a special guest from the podcast. It's totally free to join. Visit grownasswoman.guide forward slash episode 159 to RSVP. Space is limited. Be a part of the pod squad. I would love to see you there. What is a creative? Well, there are the obvious artists, authors, cartoonists, screenwriters, musicians, animators, designers, etc. You get it. Then there are those like chefs and other entrepreneurs and service providers who have businesses that may not look creative to the naked eye, but require a level of creativity to self-sustain. They all could fall under the umbrella of creative. And no matter where you land, there's a good chance you're considering a shift in how you create. This is something Jessica knows all too well. So I was teaching and I was editing. I was a series editor of the Best American Comics for six years. I wrote two textbooks about comics. Those are sort of the primary things I was doing. I did illustration for a long time, so worked as an illustrator. Everything I did was interesting, but there's just too much of it. I felt boxed in and trapped by, not by the work itself, but by the way that it had to function in the world and and what I needed to do to make a living with that. And I needed to be able to support or at least partially support my family of four, you know, a mortgage. It's like, it's not, this is not small, easy stuff. It was easy when I was 25. It was not easy when I was 40. After two decades as an author and artist, something that defined Jessica's professional identity, she knew it was time to embark on a new path and opened Autonomous Creative, where she empowers creatives with the tools they need to live successful creative lives, something she says has absolutely been lacking. I am sick and tired of creative people talking about, you know, oh, it's just normal to be a starving artist. Like you just Mm -hmm. have to like kind of hustle and grind and like, you know, work all the time and you're going to barely make it, but that's fine because you have passion and you're doing what you love. It's just crap, you know? You can't make money and have passion at the same time. That's what we're taught. Right. Or if your passion is like financial instruments, then fine. But otherwise, yeah, you're in trouble. There's something inherently about creative work that's like, if you're trying to make money with it the way I was as an author, 
the only way to do that is to just grind, just do so much stuff. And then there's a hard cap Mm -hmm. on like how far you can go. And so I'm trying to break all that down and help people create businesses that are designed around their own needs, designed around, I need this much income. I I have this much time I'm going to be able to put in. I want to be working with these kinds of people. And these are my boundaries around how I want to work with people and drawing on their creative skill set, the things that they love. That doesn't necessarily mean if they're fiction writers, I'm not going to be able to help them create a business where they're suddenly able to make, you know, $12,000 a month writing fiction. That's a whole other deal. And the place where I help people who are like fiction writers and cartoonists and artists and whatever deal with marketing their work is in authentic visibility. So this is really like Mm. most of the people in the program, not everybody, what they're doing is they're creating a brand new offer. It's rooted in what they love to do, but it's, they also have a creative practice and part of their mission, part of their needs that they're building around is I need space and time for this creative work that I'm doing. Mm. And so I need to make enough money over here with this thing in a way that feels great to me that I have both the mental and emotional and physical resources to make the work that I care about. So Okay. This is a really long roundabout way of getting back to your question of like, can creators make a living doing their work? They can. Some people are able to make a really good living as Mm -hmm. writers, as painters, as whatever. There's a lot of luck that goes into that Mm -hmm. and a lot of savvy, a lot of, you know, networking, glad handing, you know, being in the right place at the right time, all that stuff. Right. Just a lot of lightning strike kind of things. Yeah. And I don't want to discourage anybody from having that as a, a... dream. But what I see all the time is people making that kind of, that's what success looks like. And then going through basically their entire adult lives, thinking that's somehow going to happen and not doing anything else to actually take care of their real lives and what's really happening. So am I hearing this right, that you help them create some other offer that may be related to their creativity, that they can make money through so that they can also spend the time that they want to spend on the thing that they love to do. Yeah. And in, and also on friends and family, whatever, you know, if they yeah. say, I only want to spend five hours a week on this and it needs to bring in X amount of money. I'm like, all right, well, what's your pricing then? You know, like that's how we right. figured this out. Right. All of these factors have to line up. It's very strategic business model design and strategic offer design for creative people. Right. So I'm excited about it. It's been really fun so far. That's cool. I don't and know what the prime, results are going to be, but we'll see. I think it's going to be good. <laughs> and you're a prime example because you went from your business model being your creative to coaching, teaching these creatives in building something else as well. So now that you've been on both sides of the fence here, what do you think it is about creatives that hold us back? How do we hold ourselves back? I mean, it's very individual in lots of different ways. <laughs> you know, mm. like there are a lot of ways that we hold ourselves back. Do you back. see any commonalities? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I think the the number one thing I would say, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say it's essentially perfectionism. And mm. I don't necessarily mean uh, people may not identify with that word because they're like, oh, my work's not perfect. But holding back on taking action until various conditions are met, not just taking risks with the work, not uh, yes. living in imperfect action. And, you know, I mean, you're a coach, you know what this is. It's like true across the board. This is not just yeah. for creatives. Um, but I think that it hits definitely harder with creatives because the work that they're trying to present is something that's so, it's self-generated, it comes out of them. There are external standards they can see of other people doing stuff in their field mm. that they're comparing themselves to in a way that sometimes is not the case when you know, you're not in a very visible field like that. And there are, I'm probably underplaying that. That's probably true for basically everybody. But it feels like people are talking, like judging you when they're talking about mm. your novel or your piece or whatever it is, when they, you know, feeling like, how can I put this out here and and allow it to be seen by other people? But, you know, I have my own podcast called The Autonomous Creative, and I've been interviewing a bunch of very successful creatives in wildly different ways in different fields about how they got where they are. And that's what the podcast is. And the one thing everybody says is just do stuff, just do stuff and don't dilly dally around waiting for it to be 
you know, perfect or approved. You cannot wait for permission. You cannot wait for the gatekeepers. If you do, you're going to get to the end of your life, not having done stuff. And it's painful. It's hard. You know, that's why we have a community as part of what we do, because then Mm -hmm. people can kind of lean on everybody else and see that they're not alone and all this stuff. But that is the number one factor I think that holds people back is just simply not doing the stuff. You know, they just don't like not starting or not continuing. Absolutely. And it's not hard forever as far as I'm not saying it's not challenging to be a creative and to put it out there always, but it's not like it is in the beginning Mm -mm. stages. I remember when I was blogging back in the day, uh, (laughs) women who like would, would put their blogs on hold because they had to have new wallpaper done. You know, like the personal blogs used to have like, I'm having my blog redone. I'm like, that doesn't stop you from posting. Just post. It doesn't, I I never once visited a blog because it was pretty. (laughs) It was all about the content. And the same thing with podcasting. Um, There's a very, very popular podcast. I I don't even want to call it out, but it's it's in the charts. I don't even know what she uses for a mic. It sounds like crap. It sounds Mm -hmm. awful, but she is brilliant, super smart, forthcoming, um, coaches people, like really direct, Mm -hmm. great personality. The quality is not great. I would never put it out there. And she's in the charts, like the top 10, at least, maybe even the top five. Mm-hmm. And so considered at one point, like sending a little message like, hey, I have a couple of tips for you to, <laughs> to improve it. And then I realized she's not asking for those. Like she's mm-hmm. got the money to get that help, to put that out there. She's showing up and doing it. And I stopped. I'm like, you know what? It's doing the work. And so mm-hmm. the tips would you give one, I mean, I, it's as simple as just show up and take action, but like, how do you get someone who feels like they have to have all their ducks in a row to just do the damn thing? There's a bunch of different elements to this, but the first thing I would say is look at what it is that you're trying to do and break it down into the smallest possible steps. Most people are thinking about, they're thinking 18, 20, 55 steps out. You know, they're thinking about the end result of something and then not taking action on it because it feels too big. There's this right. concept that I wrote about years ago now called idea debt, which is related to this. So there's two different sort of varieties of idea debt. And it comes from a conversation I had with um, cartoonist Kazu Kibuishi. And he was saying he sees this around and I like instantly recognized it. And one kind of idea debt is where you have an idea of something and it just gets bigger and bigger in your head until it's just this huge, like it's just not achievable and you mm-hmm. never start, or you just kind of chip around at the edges and, and talk about how you're going to do it and feel crap because you're not doing it and whatever. And then the other kind of idea debt, which I see a lot of too, and I, that's type P, perfectionism. The mm-hmm. other is I call type N for nostalgia, which is ideas you're holding on to that you came up with in a past self, past life. Mm-hmm. And I know you're all about pivots, so this is very relevant for your audience. Mm-hmm. Like holding on to ideas and thinking, I have to finish that because I started it. I have to finish that because I told myself I would do it. And if I don't do it, I'm not keeping pace with myself. And you carry all this stuff with you and you have to just get rid of it, right? So those two types, type P and type N, are both, like everybody's got both somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know? But the type P, the perfectionism type, is where you have this massive, and he his his analogy was snowboarding, which I've never done, but apparently when you go on snowboarding mountains, there are Mm -hmm. these big fancy jumps and you'd see these like young, hot, dudes snowboarders at the top of the jump and they're like checking it out considering it like you know judging what they're going to do and he's like and while they're doing that they're getting colder they're getting colder Mm. physically like they're not warm anymore and also they're building up this jump in their head to where they could never hit the mark that they imagine for themselves and he's like I learned early on hit the jump or skip it Mm. You know, just one or the other, either hit the jump or don't, but it's a don. I thought that was really, really smart. Anyway, so yeah, breaking down things into tiny steps and thinking like, okay, literally, what is the next thing I have to do? Like the Mm. one next thing, make it something under 30 minutes in time. If 30 minutes is like you can't do it, make it five minutes, make it Mm -hmm. two minutes. I I talk about, you know, it's like set the bar high. No, take that bar lay it on the floor and roll over it. Like make it as easy as possible to get started. Right. You do not need to make it hard to get started. You don't need to yeah. set up conditions to make it hard to get started. So find that first thing you can do and do it. Do the first thing. And if it's 
too big, make it smaller. That's too big, make it smaller. Make it as small Mm -hmm. as you possibly can. So that's number one. And number two is don't tell yourself you're going to do it. I should do it sometime. Look Mm -hmm. at your calendar and put an actual time on your calendar to do it. Like make a slot for it. And then treat that like you have a fancy dinner reservation at this restaurant that has been closed since COVID started. Do not touch it. Make your phone pop up with a reminder to do it. Mm -hmm. Make time for it. Honor that time. It's so simple, but it comes down to that. It comes down to just, yeah, yeah, I mean, trust fall, I just got to take this action. And honestly, most of the things you need to do, nobody will see. You do them. Mm -hmm. There's no risk in it, really. And if you can calm yourself down, and you know, calm your nervous system. Be like, hey, this is. I can do this. I can, you know, whatever. Then that's that's it. I'm. I. That's all I have to do. And then I can walk away. I don't have to keep going. Make it as easy as possible, and make it non-negotiable. Got it. If you're anything like me, you need to put these important things on the calendar because everything around it is constantly changing. So I like to look at putting things on the calendar and actually following through as a little bit of discipline. Jessica sees it a different way. I like flexibility. I like to change mm-hmm. my mind last minute and and do something else. And so to be disciplined, to know that this particular thing, even if it's like upload this episode I did with Jessica into my editing software, like I don't have to say edit and write show notes and all that stuff where it's going to take me hours, but just upload mm-hmm. <laughs> just one thing. And when I start checking things off, that to me is like a dopamine hit whenever oh, I get sure. to check something off. Yeah, so when I, no, I, I, love, I love that you say this, because if we make them smaller, then we get to check off more things. Yeah. <laughs> There's a limit to that. Cause sometimes I'll make lists that are so long. I'm just like, I get overwhelmed by all the little tiny things, you know? Right. I don't love discipline as an explanation for this. Cause I think you're right, it, but I wouldn't call it the same thing. Basically. Okay. What would you call uh, it? Habit that if you build habits around this and they become normal, uh, and it just becomes what you do, then what I'm interested in is removing any friction mm. on the path between what you honestly want to be doing with your time and what you are doing with your time. I, I'm a fan of James Clear's Atomic Habits book. Yeah. And he's got a thing in there uh, in other places too. He's not the only one to talk about this. The idea of habit stacking. Mm-hmm. So finding something you already do every day. Like if you get up every morning, you brush your teeth, you go downstairs, you make coffee, you have some toast, you have coffee. Uh, what happens after coffee? What's the thing that happens next? That's an opportunity for you because it happens right. every day. There's not right. a day. If you're a coffee, I'm not a coffee drinker. I'm a tea drinker. And mm. I drink tea every day the same kind of way. But if I don't, mm-hmm. if I'm not somewhere at home and I can't get good tea, I'm not drinking tea. You know, like I can live without it. But coffee drinkers, mm. I know, they're like, oh, they feel terrible, right? Yes. Nobody skips their coffee in the morning. That Correct. is an amazing, amazing hook to add other habits onto. Where do you set your coffee cup down when you make coffee? Are you, you know, asking me? I'm Well, sure. <laughs> Where do you set your coffee cup down when you make On coffee? On my nightstand. I drink, uh, my husband brings me coffee and I drink it in bed and I play Wordle and I write uh, uh, in my journal a little bit. Right? So that's a habit. You yes. do that every day. You get a cup yes. of coffee and it's on your nightstand. If you or yourself are making the coffee and you have to decide where to put it down, why not decide to put it down on your writing desk? You know, that you have like a coaster there and the the place you're allowed to put your coffee down is on your writing desk. Right. That's one step closer to actually writing in your journal or whatever it is, you know? Absolutely. Set the table, like get everything kind of ready for yourself. Set your coffee down, do the thing. Give yourself, if a half hour is too long, 10 minutes, two minutes, make it as easy as possible. And as it becomes a set habit, it doesn't it require zero discipline. Right. You just feel weird if you don't do it. Yeah, totally. But what would you call a habit before it becomes a habit? Well, it does require a little bit of effort, right? But right. I think if you make it, and, and so this is, my whole deal is strategy, right? Ha- mm. Like use strategy, use planning in order to, again, remove all this friction and make things yeah. straightforward. So one of my key teachings is is to use what I call top threes. So top three things you're going to do on a given day. Mm -hmm. Um, And they should include things like you have to, you know, call the dentist or something like that. You know, it's not just creative stuff, but it's like one of those things should be work on my novel, you know, Mm. or not even work on my novel, spend 30 minutes on my novel. Yeah. And then it needs a place on your calendar, you know, Mm -hmm. and you do these at least the day before, if not several days ahead. If you do it in the moment, it's you're, you're already you know, your brain is trapped in scarcity mode 
and mm. you're like, I, there's no time. I can't, blah, 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 I have to do this. Or like, you, you know, you look at your phone and you're gone or whatever it is. Yeah. You have to plan it ahead and set up your schedule around it, set up your plan, you know, your plan around it. And I know you want to be flexible and whatever, which to a certain extent, there's, there's ways to deal with that too, but habits mm. are not the place for that. Right. So if you want to have a writing habit every morning, you have to plan for that and make sure there's room for that. The other piece of that then is planning how you're going to build this habit. So what is it? Where is it? When is it? What habit is it stacked on? What's the trigger? You know, determine all these things about this habit that you want to build before <laughs> you want to do it, like not at the same time. Right. Set it all right. up. And then in the moment, you know, something pings and you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. And it does take a little bit of discipline at that moment uh, and probably for a like a number of weeks or whatever, it'll take a little bit of discipline to follow right. your intention. But once it gets set, and you'll know it's set when you don't do it and you feel weird. You yes. know, there's no specific amount of time this takes. It could be three days. It could be six months. You know, I don't know. But if you do something re- regularly like that and then you stop doing it and you go, ooh, that feels weird. Like, I don't like that. <laughs> then you know you have it. Like, that is your habit. Right. right. And it's totally possible because you see that with, you know, negative habits. Um, how many people, I, I know people who have been smokers and they had to quit coffee in order to stop smoking because they had stacked the habits mm-hmm. together that they had a cigarette every time that they would have a cup of coffee. And mm-hmm. so, you know, habit stacking is happening automatically, mm-hmm. you know? So of course it, it's a no brainer to happen, um, in, in your best interest, you know, oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole other thing about how do you undo other habits, which we won't get into right now, but it's, you know, it's, it's similar, right? Un- untying yeah. those things from each other. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you talk about priorities um, mm-hmm. with, and again, this is a generalization. If you're a creative and you're listening, you're like, I have no trouble prioritizing. Well, then you are the unicorn. Congratulations. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, Bye-bye. Have fun. But when it comes to prioritizing our creativity, uh, the things that are, that really matter to us, what are we doing wrong? What can we improve upon, Jessica? Where's there room for improvement? I think the main thing that I come up against with students and clients around this is they have not actually decided what matters outside of the project itself. What are the qualities of success to them? What are the things that they want to you know, get out of something? Because what I see is, yes, it's this thing about Are you making time in your life for the work? And that to me is purely habit building. I know people truly do want to be doing this creative work, whether it's building a new business or it's writing a book or whatever, you know, they do want to be doing it truly deeply. Um, And there's a lot of fear that stops them, but there's also just a lot of, you know, the big roiling black mass of unknown, like that's the main thing that stops them Mm -hmm. is just not having a process around completing it. So anything else is easier. And so you have to build habits around doing the work. Okay. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is which work, right? Anybody who's creative has got like 18,000 things they want to do. And so if you have a full life already and you're trying to work on more than one other thing, everything's going to move like molasses and Mm -hmm. be really frustrating and mostly not get finished. So I have this whole one goal to rule them all thing that I do where the idea is that you have to, and it's not really one goal is one project, you know, it just sounds better to Mm -hmm. say one goal, but you know, it flows better. Yeah. It flows better, (laughs) but you have to establish the, the, the criteria that matter to you and like how much, and then, and then say, okay, of all this idea. So we do like an idea inventory and it's like of all of these ideas and these things you want to be working on which one is most aligned with where you want to be and what success looks like to you. And I think that thought process of like, what really does matter to me? Do I need to make money with this? Do I want to make money? Which is this the thing that I most imagine being like my future? Is this something I just need to be able to finish stuff and get it done? Do I need to be working in exploratory ways? Do I need to be learning something? Do I need, you know, what are the things that really matter and once you establish those things for yourself and you're clear about that, it's much, much easier, still hard, but much easier to be confident that you're putting your time into the right thing. And so if you're not confident that you're putting your time into the right thing and you're investing your effort, your time, your heart, your love, everything into the right project, that's one of the reasons people don't do stuff because they're like, but what about this other thing? But I should work on da 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 If you don't know what you're supposed to be working on, you're not going to work on it. That's strategic 
you know, approach to this as well. And if you're not committed to that thing, right? Because how many times do we listen to the noise that's out there on the interwebs that tells us, no, you're prioritizing the wrong thing or you're doing it the wrong way, that I see a lot of women specifically who are like, I'm doing this thing. And then they hear all these voices that are not their own (laughs) and they start to kind of go off into all these different paths and they never move because they're constantly jumping from one path to another, trying Mm -hmm. to find the magic ticket. Mm -hmm. So do you find that with your students? And if so, how do you get them back to listen to themselves and stay on course? I mean, it's really tricky. There's a lot of myths out there about what it looks like to make creative work and what it should be like in the world. And to shut that out and follow your own instincts is pretty difficult. I think, again, that process of going through your priorities and what matters to you is really useful. And maybe you have, it has a different context, you know, at that point where it's like, well, what elements need to be in this project I've already decided? You know, what are the elements that are important to me? And kind of, it's separating the action from the thinking about the action, right? That's the Mm. strategic element of all of this. And I, I promote this idea of a scientific mindset where everything you're doing is data, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you can look at what is happening and think, well, that's fascinating how that, you know, and just treat it with this detachment, then you can make better decisions about it. But you can't do that in the moment, right? In the moment, Mm -hmm. your emotions are going to take over, which is normal. We're all, you know, oversized, mostly hairless primates. You know, we have (laughs) ways that we behave in the moment. But so Mm -hmm. we also have this great brain so we can separate things apart in time and make decisions in that way. So if you're thinking about a project you want to do and you're like, well, I'm hearing that I need to have this element and this part and this part and this part in order for it to be successful. Let me think about what those things are and what goals are attached to those things. So if you're Mm -hmm. thinking about something like starting a business and you're like, well, I need to be on social media and I need to have a podcast and I need to have a great website and I have to have a logo design and I have to da 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 The question to ask about all of those things is what's the goal of these things? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose behind having them? Why? Just ask why. You know, why do I need fancy, a fancy website or whatever? Like you were saying earlier about the blogs. It's like, why? Why do I need that? Yeah. Um, And if you can come up with a really good reason you need that, okay. But it needs to be a reason that has not just because so-and-so told me to. Right. But there's some kind of metrics and data behind it. This This is actually like very close to what we're dealing with. We deal with this all the time in the incubator because what we're developing are higher end service offers a lot of the stuff that's out there about what to do with your business isn't relevant. You know, we're doing, Mm. we're using a, you know, rapid validation, minimum viable product idea for first offers. So it's not fully built out. We're not going to have fancy websites. We're not going to do anything fancy. It's all going to be like, Mm -hmm. you know, minimum viable, like whatever, like the basics you need, but trying to escape from this idea that, Oh, I need an email campaign. I need social media You know, some of them do need really good photography. They need that because that's what's going to, that's essential. But most of them don't, you know, they can find stock images from somewhere. Right, right. Or already have images that are good enough. So you have to look at the end goal. What, what is it that you want out of this? And is this thing that you're doing, does it have any connection at all to that end goal or not? Which is easier said than done. I mean, I can say that all day, but I have trouble in my own business doing that. I'm Mm. trying to do that right now with a whole bunch of stuff that's just like, (sighs) It's going to take me six months to get the data to figure out if this is the right thing or not. Now what do I do for the next six months? There's a lot of that. So I don't mean to underplay it at all, but just to understand, like, if you're sitting there in the moment, you're like, what do I, like, I can't, there's all this, make a list of all the things and then come back tomorrow (laughs) and write down why all these things, you know, and maybe another day, write down, what's your mission? Like, what are you trying Mm -hmm. to achieve with this? And then do these things match up? Coming back to that, I think is really powerful because it's endless, right? How many times a week do I hear, you should be on TikTok, you should be on Clubhouse, you should be doing this and doing that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, All okay, the time. you know, and th- that initial reaction is like, oh, okay, that's the, that's the magic pill, right? That's the one that's going to make this grow really quickly. And, you know, no, <laughs> I know where my audience is. I know who I want to connect with. I love having the conversations and building relationships. I don't need all these different other places to to be because all it does is dilute 
uh, my energy. I mean, it just spreads me too thin anyway. And then uh, there's no real focus, but you know, I, I see that with other creatives too. I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of messaging out there and I love a couple things. I love number one, just it's as simple as coming back to what do you want? What is the goal? And number two, what you said about what you're teaching your students is not about some flashy offer and, and shady sales tactics to get people into their funnels and all of that, but it's creating an offer minimum, (laughs) just like, and that's the thing, like, I'm, I have purchased all of the extra software and and things that people tell you that you need. And it comes back to sort of reteaching that to every person you meet, that it doesn't have to be so complicated. And to myself, by the way, oh, like, yes. you know, this is not something that You're I number have one like, student. <laughs> yeah, number one student, number one, you know, constantly failing, relearning, you know, redoing the work student. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I've bought lots of courses and programs. I've thought to myself, I really should spend more time on Instagram. I've like done, you know, experiments with various things. And frequently it's because I'm not really thinking about like, what's the goal? Or I don't even understand like what the connection between my action and the end result will be if there is Mm. any, you know, I just don't get it. And uh, sometimes later, hopefully I learn and then I'm like, wait, really? <laughs> you learn again? <laughs> yeah. Again, or for the first time. I have to learn for the first time sometime, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah. I wasn't born learning, you know, knowing this stuff. That's right. um, But yeah, I mean, this idea, and I think that it really, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? Because a lot of people I work with, you know, they're cartoonists or they're selling prints or they're doing something like that. They are selling books and that's a very different beast from trying to sell a high-end service offer. And there's different tactics that go along with those things and different approaches go along with those things. There's more crossover than you'd think, you know, there definitely Mm. is. But I think it's important to recognize that it's easy for people who, you know, sell whatever coaching packages for thousands and thousands of dollars to say, oh yeah, I just keep it super simple. It is simple when you're selling books that cost, you know, 1099 or something, and that's where you're trying to make your living. um, It's a very different picture. Yeah. You're going to have to sell a lot of books. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, I think not a lot of people talk, not enough people talk about, um, even just that whole book world. Like it's very few who are making bank on their books, (laughs) you know, enough to make a living. Not even, not even like the, the, you know, the Mel Robbins of the world who, who, who you know, a Brene Brown, you know, who Mm -hmm. might do really well in their books, but you have more, it's just like A-list celebrities here in LA, you know, how many people who are working actors, thousands upon thousands of working actors that you would never recognize in a grocery store. Same thing with books. There, there are some amazing pieces of work out there. And I, I sometimes have the opportunity to meet the author and they're like, yeah, I had to take out a loan, <laughs> you know, to, to make this book happen. And I didn't even make my money back. Yeah. And so- that must be another one, like know what your goal is, because it's certainly not going to be to buy a vacation home. For well, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a ton of mythology around that and, and a lot of, and a lot of guilt and pressure tactics. Like it goes back to the beginning of our conversation where people feel like they have to, you know, you'll actually have people saying to you, like, why are you doing this other thing? If you were a real writer, you would be making all your money. You'd be living off your books. And it's like, have you ever talked to real writers? Because- <laughs> Virtually all of them are teachers or something else. You know, they're mm-hmm. doing something else to to support themselves. My father is a literary agent, actually, and he told me early on that um, it's extremely rare for conventionally pu- published authors to earn out their advance, which means like you get paid a certain amount, like a chunk of money, on contract. Mm-hmm. Like when you pay you you sign a contract and when you publish, um, which is an advance against your royalties. It's very rare to sell enough books to pay back that entire advance. Now, don't worry about the publishers. They're paying you way less than, you know, they're making money regardless. Right. But the authors, when they publish the book, that's the last payment they ever see from that book. And then, you know, they're exhausted and doing marketing, trying to do marketing for the book. And they got to be already working on another book in order to try to bring in the next advance. That's right. what I, that was what was going on with me. I had, mm. you know, healthy advances, but they're no way paid for my life over the time it took me to make the books. 
And right. I, before I even finished the book, I should have been out there pitching the next book, you know, in order to have that next advance come in. I've, I want to say never earned out on any of my books, but I believe I earned, yes, I earned out once when I did a 32 page floppy comic for This American Life called Radio and Illustrated Guide, earned that one out and made good money on it, actually. That was a very good nice. uh, project. But the, all my other books, even people are like, oh my God, you did this book, you did that book. That's amazing. And, and I'm very proud of my books. I do not want to run them down at all. That's not the point. Mm-hmm. But they're not money makers. Right. And and they're very, you know, I, it's so funny. I should have had it right here in front of me. I do. This, this is ha- seriously. This is how we first so, met. <laughs> that's how we first met out on the wire. I'm going to link to all your books in the show notes, by the way. But um, just to a little sidebar, we met because I was coaching a group of women um, launching a podcast and one woman brought up your book and then another one was like, oh my gosh, I love that book. And then the whole group was like, I have to have that book. And so we had a full on discussion. One of one of my coaching classes um, was all about your book. And so I said, you know, I'm going to reach out to her and see if she'll come in as a guest. I have a great photo of all of you guys holding up my book. <laughs> like you, oh, you so did cool. a Zoom photo of like everybody, a screen grab. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really great. So if anybody doesn't know what this book is, Out on the Wires is a comic book. That is an investigation storytelling techniques using the research that I did with, you know, about a dozen different major podcasts and radio shows, including This American Life, Radio Lab, The Moth, um, Radio Diaries, Snap Judgment, Planet Money. Yeah, just some, just some small, so. small radio <laughs> podcasts, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I did a podcast out of it too. Like I made my own podcast as a result yes. of that was like a fun, creative project as well. Um, so cool. Yeah. So, so a book I'm immensely proud of. It's made a huge difference in my life all across the board, but it has not earned out. It may one day, right. but it's going to be years right. out before it does. But how do you see success when it comes to a book like that? Is it earning enough money or, I mean, just the fact that you had people all over who are completely obsessed with this book? Yeah, no, that is success. <laughs> Definitely that's success. But in terms of my own goals for taking yeah. care of myself, it's not enough, right? Like right. it really matters to me. But so people who were in my position 2015 when I made this pivot to this business, typically, you know, I was on a path already to basically do this, which is, I, I became and still am actually department chair of an illustration department here in Philadelphia mm-hmm. at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts you get academic jobs based on your credentials as an author, right? Mm -hmm. There are other people who go into editorial work. They may be art directors or editors or something like that. And then also authors, they may have speaking careers. Plenty of nonfiction authors will have workshops and do, you know, they do something on sort of on the back of their book. I did a lot of workshops using Out on the Wire. I haven't pursued it lately, but I really enjoy doing that. So there are Mm -hmm. ways to leverage the book into ways to make a living, Right. And that's what most authors do. If they are successful as authors, it's because they are good. Their work is great and it is the most important thing to them. And they use it essentially as a tool to find lucrative positions to do other things or more lucrative than (laughs) writing books anyway. Mostly. There are a few authors who are just authors. That's what they do. But it is rare, uh, relatively speaking. To learn more about Jessica's workshops and coaching programs, visit jessicaable.com. And starting May 2nd, she's offering a free five-day challenge called Creative Compass, where she'll lead you through creating a complete personalized system you need to buckle down and finish your amazing, inspiring, and maybe overwhelming creative dream projects. Check out grownasswoman.guide forward slash episode 159 for more information. How does one know if their creative passion should be a hobby or they should pursue it as uh, trying to make a living from it? I don't, I don't know that there's a way to know that. Uh, but I, I think, again, it, it goes back to investigating your own priorities and what looks like success to you and trying to shut out the noise of the world telling you that it's not legit if you're not making money at it or enough money or a lot of money. I talk a lot of people out of trying to make a living with their work. You know, I tell them, you don't have to, you can if you want to, but it is not required. And for a lot of people, that's just like a, just like a weight off their shoulders, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And if anybody needs that in the audience, it's yours. Like you do not have to, you can be 
absolutely j- legit serious artist without selling anything ever. And when you do sell things, sell your work, it changes your relationship to the work. Mm. Do you want that? You know, comics for me, I mean, so long ago that I started doing this, I don't even remember, but it, it didn't start out as like a job idea. You know, it started out as just doing it because I was really into comics. But at some point, everything I do in comics has to be related to some kind of monetizable thing, you know, which changes the choices I make uh, and where I invest my time and like how I'm going to think about it and how I'm going to, you know, like, well, I'm not going to do that. That would never sell, you know, that kind of question. This happens with people who are visual artists, you know, where they have work that they want to be doing, but it's not work that's selling. They have this other stuff that's selling. They got to do more of that. That's, I think, a really important thing to consider. Like, do, do you care? You know, are you willing, are, are you sturdy enough, <laughs> you know, to, <laughs> with your work to be like, yeah, it's cool. I've, that's fine with me. Um, yeah. Do you enjoy hearing what other people have to say about it, you know, and engaging with an audience? If you really don't enjoy that, well, you may not want to do it in public. On the other hand, I feel like what's really underplayed, and this is what we're trying to do in the incubator, is that creative people are in- incredibly agile, adaptable. I mean, they're creative, right? And they, they've, they've been scrappy. They know how to make mm. stuff work. And so figuring out ways in which stuff you love to do applies a little bit like obliquely to job or work or business possibilities is kind of what I love doing the most. Where it's like, okay, you're a novelist, you're writing novels, fine find an agent, you know, like do your deal. Like, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, in authentic visibility, we will help you figure out how to talk about it, how to be clear, how to, you know, build your social media presence and the audience there and all that kind of stuff. But part of being an author for you has been this journey through, I don't know, like a copy and, you know, maybe research in ancient Egyptian something, or, you know, I don't know what, like <laughs> whatever it is. So how could we use your archaeological skills, <laughs> mm. you know, and your something else skills and the fact that you have this background in corporate HR or something and like build a business out of that, make something out of that that's going to feel uniquely you, that you're going to feel valued, that you're going to be able to work with people who appreciate what, you know, what you specifically offer and do work that's creative, but it's not like, and that what that does is takes the pressure off the books to bring the money in. And then you can make freer choices about them. You can say, okay, well, this is kind of non-commercial, but whatever, this is what I care about. And mm-hmm. so I'm going to spend my time with my book. You know, I'm going to incorporate all these ele- elements that I know are going to make it a little harder to, you know, get to a mass audience, but that's cool because I don't care. Right. You know, like I want the right audience, but it doesn't have to pay for anything. And it's fine if I'm with a small publisher, I self-publish or whatever. If you separate those things, but you you still use your creative you know, like in my business and I'm, I am, you know, again, customer one, like <laughs> student one, I use all, all of my project planning background from multiple huge book projects, you know, course planning, all that stuff. Everything has gone into this business, all mm-hmm. of the strate- strategic planning, all of the like scrappy, like income, you know, planning, like everything I learned as creative is why I have this business and why I can run it and why it's, I'm good at it. And so I don't feel like there was a moment when I was switching from primary focus on being an author to being, you know, to owning a business and having that maybe on my main thing, thinking like, what does that mean about my years as an author? Does that mean they don't, they're they don't mean anything. Mm. And, and I had to mourn the loss a little bit. And there is, there is loss, right? Like I'm not seen the same way currently by new people meeting me. I mean, they're, they're interested in my background and stuff, but it's like, I used to get invited to lots of festivals and things. I don't, don't, that doesn't happen anymore, you know, like who has festivals anymore, but you know what I mean? Um, (laughs) So there was a, that transition was a little, there was a little pain involved there, but Basically, I was like, yeah, but I couldn't be who I am now. I couldn't do what I'm doing now without where I came from and all this, exactly. all the stuff that went into who I am, which I think is yes. perfect for your theme, Grown Ass Woman's Guide. You know, like the, this idea that like when you're a grown ass woman, you have so much to give and like so much to use and so much fuel and so many ideas. And when you allow somebody else to tell you that, like everything has to get channeled into this very conventional little path. You know, you're letting other people decide for you in a way that's going to be ultimately detrimental to you. 
You know, you you have to be able to decide for yourself. The most important thing is that you are working in a way that feels aligned with your values and that you are well-resourced, you're getting what you need from this work. And when that's the case, then you have room for the creative work. Absolutely. And I love that you said that as far as, you know, all the things that you've experienced, all the things that you've been through in your life, they're not throwaway. They have they actually contribute sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly to who you are and how you're showing up today. So it's all worthwhile. Yes. <laughs> no matter what your path was. Yes. So awesome. That's a great note to end on. Jessica, thank you for doing this. Thank you. To learn more about Jessica's workshops and coaching programs, visit jessicaable.com. And starting May 2nd, she's offering a free five-day challenge called Creative Compass, where she'll lead you through creating a complete personalized system you need to buckle down and finish your amazing, inspiring, and maybe overwhelming creative dream projects. Check out grownasswoman.guide forward slash episode 159 for more information. By the way, did you know that the video version of all of the conversations here on the Grown Ass Woman's Guide are now on YouTube? I'll also link to that channel, so be sure to head over and hit subscribe. Not only can you get every episode, but I'll be adding some original content over there as well. Be sure to check it out. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, share it with a friend, rate and review on your favorite podcast app, or email me at hello at grownasswoman.guide. I'd love to hear what you think. Until next time, you are a grown-ass woman. Act accordingly. Spring has sprung, and with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconu. Coconu is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments, with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut.